Research and teaching interests focus on the intersections of conflict and political violence, race, gender, and inequality, peace building, and African politics. Please join me in welcoming my distinguished colleague, Professor Zoe Max. Friends, colleagues, students, and distinguished guests, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School tonight's speaker, His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo. He is the fifth president of Ghana's fourth republic, as I'm sure you all are well aware. He was sworn into office on January 7th, 2017, but long before becoming president, he has been a prominent champion of human rights, rule of law, justice, freedom, and democracy in Ghana. President Akufo Addo has held numerous positions of public service and has played active roles in the public life of Ghana since 1970. He served as Attorney General and Minister for Justice from 2001 to 2003, and as Minister for Foreign Affairs from April 2003 to July 2007, under the government of the former President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency John Kufour. Prior to that, he served three terms as a Member of Parliament from 1997 to 2008. As a lawyer, President Akufo Addo undertook many of the most important constitutional cases of the modern era in Ghana. These cases protected the independence of the judiciary, citizens' rights to demonstrate without a police permit, the right of equal access of all political parties to the state-owned media. These were transformational cases in protecting freedom of speech in the Republic. In December 2007, His, Excell His Excellency was elected as the new Patriotic Party's presidential candidate. He ran two close races in 2008 and in 2012, and in both instances, he played a key role in upholding Ghana's role as a beacon of democracy on the African continent. In his path to Jubilee House, where he now lives and governs, Akufo Addo accepted a contentious loss in the 2008 runoff elections and he accepted a Supreme Court case that decided the 2012 election, not in his favor. He led his supporters in graciously conceding defeat, congratulating his opponent, and focusing on accepting results in order to protect and uphold Ghana's democracy, its economic growth, and its political vibrancy. This statesmanship culminated in the African Union, the European Union, the United Nations, the United States of America, the Christian Council of Ghana, and the chief imam of Ghana, amongst others, applauding President Akufo Addo for preserving Ghana's peace and maintaining Ghana's status as a leading light for democratic freedom and institutions across the continent. Now, as president, he is focused on providing free secondary education to all Ghanaian students and, through educational excellency, driving the country's development in the 21st century. Distinguished guests, friends, Please join me in welcoming His Excellency, President Nana Akufo Addo of Ghana. So what do I do? I come straight from the podium. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, begin by thanking the Kennedy, the Harvard Kennedy School Institute of Politics and the Harvard University Center for African Studies for the invitation to come here and deliver this speech at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, which has been a very important uh, platform for public speakers from here and abroad speaking. I hope that my country, Ghana, is not going to be judged by any deficiencies of mine. <laughs> These are purely personal to me, and they're not at all representative. Since I had the honor to become the president of the Republic of Ghana over two years ago, 
I've had the good fortune of addressing audiences in some of the great universities of the world. In the United States of America, for example, I've been afforded the opportunity of speaking at some of our famous ones. The first was at Columbia on the 18th of September 2017, and then at the other place, Yale, on, <laughs> on 27th September 2018. Today I'm at Harvard, the oldest institution of higher learning in America, and in a few days I'll be speaking at the University of Chicago, and later on in the year at Princeton. I'm indeed very fortunate, and so I've been now begun to weigh the possibility of joining the famed American speaking tour circuit when I leave Jubilee House, the seat of our nation's presidency, hopefully voluntarily. This place, Harvard University, was founded by one of the most remarkable personalities of American history, described as, quote, a godly gentleman and a lover of learning, unquote, John Harvard, who devoted his life to the betterment of society. At Harvard, you're educated to be citizens and citizen leaders of society. And the array of persons who have distinguished and are no doubt distinguishing themselves in diverse fields of endeavor in their various countries illustrates how well Harvard has done and continues to do its work. I suspect that of all the universities in the world, only Oxford does a better job. <laughs> but a university that has produced iconic leaders like Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, his brother Robert Francis Kennedy, Barack Hussein Obama, outstanding African-American leaders like William E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, and some of the modern polymaths like Ralph Nader, Al Gore, Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg has not been done badly at all. Harvard holds a special place, too, in the history of the African continent. There's a long list of Africans who have been through these hallowed halls and gone on to influence and direct the affairs of their countries. I'd like to mention just a few. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former president of Liberia, who was the first elected female president in Africa. The late Kwon Kensinaka, former vice president of Ghana. The late Morgan Sangarai, the former prime minister of Zimbabwe. Nguzi Okunjo Iwela, a renowned, renowned economist and former finance minister of Nigeria. Abdiweli Mohamed Ali, the former prime minister of Somalia. The late Aziz Zedki, former prime minister of Egypt. Sophia Kufu current Chief Justice of Ghana, the second woman to occupy that office, and the late Kobla Dumont, outstanding Ghanaian medium practitioner, persons who in varying degrees have had great impact on the development of their countries and of Africa. So you can see Harvard is a part of Africa's DNA and continues to incubate new generations of Africans who will persevere with a tradition of service and leadership. The John F. Kennedy Forum has acquired a formidable reputation, and I'm gra grateful that its organizers decided to make me part of this year's events. I've chosen to speak on a theme of Africa's relevant to our contemporary situation, befitting of the Africa Development Conference, a theme which sums up the essence of African aspirations, empowering the youth, Africa's golden future, unquote. To talk about the future is to talk about the unknown. At the same time, to talk about the future is to talk about the hopes, aims, and objectives of a people. I'm unable to validate the saying that the golden age is always in the past. It is obvious that Africa's golden age is yet to come. How can we not hope for a golden age, a golden future, when we are blessed with such enormous material wealth 
and vibrant human resources which remain largely untapped. The world, particularly Africa, has the largest generation of young people in history. I place great hope in their capacity to shape the future of Africa and make Africa the line that it was meant to be. Africa has to have a strategy to reap the demographic dividend that a youthful population offers. The Asian tigers, so-called, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Malaysia, are where they are today because of the systematic investments they made in the development of their human capital. Their period of boom and growth happened when their populations shifted from ones of many dependents to ones dominated by, dominated by working age groups. And this is where Africa is today. We should not fail to realize that we are at the brink of a breakthrough. Having said that, I must obviously add that the population opportunity will not automatically guarantee us a future of growth and prosperity. Demographic dividends do not come automatically. They have to be earned. To realize the dividend, African countries have to invest in the empowerment, education, and employment of our young people. With over 40% of its working population between the ages of 15 and 24, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. This represents a staggering amount of human capital. And according to the African Economic Outlook, this set number is set to double by 2045. Yet too many of them are trapped in poverty, with few opportunities to learn or to earn a decent living. According to the World Bank, youth account for 60% of all African unemployed. For those that manage to find work, they do not do so in a place that pays a good wage or develops their skills or provides a measure of job security. The Brookings Institute states that more than 70% of the youth in the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi, Mali, Rwanda, Senegal, and Uganda are either self-employed or contributing to family work. No one needs to tell us that mass employment in Africa, especially amongst her youth, is a ticking time bomb. The so-called Arab Spring showed clearly the lack of employment opportunities can undermine social cohesion and political stability with between 10 to 12 million youths joining the labor market every year, Africa has to pay maximum attention to job creation. Ahmad Salkida, a Nigerian journalist who has had rare access to Boko Haram, the jihadist group operating in Nigeria, has said that although the sector is driven by ideology, Pervasive unemployment in northern Nigeria makes predictably for easy recruitment of jobless young people. A World Bank survey in 2011 showed that 40% of those who join rebel movements say they are motivated by a lack of jobs. Young people are willing to risk everything to improve their circumstances. We have seen in recent times high numbers of them taking harrowing risks around the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean, trying to reach the mirage of a better life in Europe. What this means is that if we provide them the right environment in Africa, they'll make our continent great. If these youth are encouraged to spend their considerable energies at home, Africa could experience huge economic gains. There are self-evident steps that can help African countries achieve the demographic dividend. Increasing investment in young people is key. This includes promoting quality education that prepares, prepares them for a future of opportunities. A diversity of training will be needed, from quality primary and secondary schools to technical and vocational training schools to teacher training colleges to research intensive universities. For young people to be able to exploit the economic opportunities that abound in Africa, they must have the skills and training necessary to take advantage of them. 
In doing this, Africa has to fashion an education policy that is also gender sensitive. For women are a clear majority of the African population. As the African Union's gender champion, I'm aware that young people feel the sting, young women feel the sting of unemployment even more sharply. The Africa Development Bank found that in Africa too, it is easier for men to get jobs than it is for women, even if they have equivalent skills and experience. In Ghana, we're aiming at parity and reaching parity in terms of female-male enrollment in our universities. Also essential is empowering women and girls by guaranteeing their sexual and reproductive health and human rights. This enables them to determine when and whom to marry and the number of children that they want to have. They will have the tools to determine the direction of their destiny. When women and girls are able to make these decisions, they're able, better able to complete their educations and pursue jobs. That is why the free senior high school policy instituted by my government two years ago, which is expanding dramatically access to secondary school education for all of Ghana's young people, is opening up greater and greater vistas of opportunities for Ghana's young female legis uh, population. Legislation is on its way to redefine basic education, to encompass kindergarten up to the end of senior high school, and make it compulsory for all of Ghana's children. This 21st century is the century of science and technology. The mastery of digital technology by African youth must be the compelling challenge for them if indeed they're able to survive in this competitive technological environment. They have to survive. The Costa Rican example should serve as an inspiration for Africa. Costa Rica moved from being a banana exporting country to a net exporter of microprocessor chips that earns them billions of dollars in contrast to the few million dollars from the export of bananas. Technology is what helps us to make the world truly a global village and enables once poor people to become prosperous and scale up the value of their economic activities. There's a set of statistics that I've been pulling out to make the point. Between Ghana and our neighbor Côte d'Ivoire, we produce 65% of the world's output of cocoa. The chocolate industry is a 100 billion United States dollars industry. And we, who produce 65% of its raw material, cocoa, make less than $6 billion from the toil of our farmers, i.e. barely 6% of the entire value chain of cocoa. The farmers whose efforts make possible the growth of this lucrative industry receive nearly a pittance for their labors. This is not right. We need to change the statistics. If we simply ground and sow the cocoa in post form, instead of selling the cocoa beans, we double our earnings. In much the same way as we double our earnings from gold if we sold it refined, then in its raw states. I do understand that there are nations who have built their industrial complexes around the value chain of our raw commodities. It is time to change that setup. In Ghana, through my government's one district, one factory policy, we're ensuring an even spatial spread of industries. This policy is intended to promote rapid rural industrialization at the district level, driven by strong linkages to agriculture and other natural resource endowments in order to create jobs and development. It's time we were responsible process for processing our own resources. It is time that we in Africa manage our resources well to generate wealth for our populations. What is true of our agricultural resources is equally so, if not more so, for our mineral resources. 30% of the Earth's remaining minerals are to be found on the continent of Africa. 
We've been told by the highly respected former president of the Republic of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, chair of the high-level panel that produced a report on illicit financial flows from Africa, commissioned by the Joint African Union Commission and United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Conference of African F F Ministers for Finance, Planning, and Economic Development, that Africa is losing annually more than 50 billion United States dollars through illicit financial outflows. He revealed further that between 2000 and 2008, 252 billion, i.e. 56 percent, was from the extractive industries, including mining. Imagine the implications of us ensuring that even 50 percent of these amounts remain on the continent. We have to work feverishly at that. There's a critical need to involve young people in decisions that affect them. We cannot talk about sustainable development without the active involvement of youth. A former United Nations Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, argues that when we give young people decent jobs, political weight, negotiating muscle, and real influence in our world, they will create a brighter future. Hence, Africa cannot talk about shaping the future without talking about the welfare and well-being of young people. It is important that Africa take these ideas forward to harness the value of a youthful population, holding human rights, gender equality, development of human capital, and dignity at the center of all of our investments. Only by providing opportunities that open the future to all young people do we create a brighter future. The median age in Ghana is 19 and a half years. Hence the overriding importance of democratic consolidation in Africa. Post-colonial authoritarian rule failed the African peoples. It continued the impoverishment of our people, which is the consequence of colonialism and imperialism. As a result, a new paradigm shift is being undertaken to un to guide the transformation of poor agrarian economies into value-adding industrialized economies on the basis of democratic values and institutions. Africa is indeed attempting something novel in human history. We're trying to use the instruments of democracy to propel societies from poverty to prosperity. All previous successful efforts in this direction have been made either by authoritarian regimes or by limited democracies. Britain is a case in point. The 19th century Industrial Revolution took place against a background of limited franchise for the mass of the British people. Indeed, the wide extensions of the franchise by the Great Reform Acts of the 19th century went hand in hand with the evolution of the Industrial Revolution. And it was only in 1928 that women finally achieved the right to vote long after the, after the triumph of the Industrial Revolution. America is another case in point, where for most of the 19th and 20th centuries, her black population was denied the right to vote, even though the Industrial Revolution also triumphed in America in the late 19th century. We in Africa are proceeding on the basis of full universal adult suffrage in promotion of human rights on a broad scale. If we succeed, which I'm very confident we will, we would have done something unprecedented in human history. It would enable us to build a new progressive African civilization, grounded on a system of governance that respects individual liberties and human rights, the rule of law, and the principles of democratic accountability, and rooted in our own indigenous cultural identity to make its own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. My speech has many of the makings of a dream, but it is a dream that is grounded in reality. I don't accept that the African has a DNA that dooms us to failure. Africans can, like all the other peoples that have succeeded, make life meaningful and worth living for their own people. We must cultivate an irrepressible desire to do right by the citizens. The resources of our nations belong to our people. 
They do not belong to the political class or any other elite. To appropriate the wealth of our nations for the benefit of a few is both morally wrong and criminally culpable. On my part, I've established the Office of Special Prosecutor, an independent nonpartisan body with the relevant professional capability, led by a renowned anti-corruption campaigner, indeed who is a leading member of the opposition, to investigate and prosecute exclusively acts of corruption. The office is to lead the fight and hold public officials, past and present, accountable for their stewardship of public finances. <laughs> Africans, dare I say, can and must do it themselves. We cannot expect others to do it for us. Many of us felt a sense of guilt and shame when the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, said, and I quote, Africa is the scar on the conscience of the world, unquote. We can and must build Africa on a strong foundation of the ability and industry of its citizens, an Africa that exemplifies the true spirit of its people working towards the common goal of better existence. Honest, disciplined management of public finances, strong macroeconomic fundamentals, competitive business environment, enhanced mobilization of savings and investments. These are some of the basic elements that have to be established to permit the growth of robust economies on the continent, which can then generate jobs and rising living standards for our young people. They are the mix of Ghana's current economic profile, a mix that has enabled the Ghanaian economy to grow from 3.6% in 2016 to 8.5% in our first year of office in 2017, 6.8% last year, and a projected 7.9% this year, making Ghana one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. <laughs> there is an abundance of dynamic entrepreneurial talent on our continent, striving to ex struggling to express itself and take advantage of such conditions. We have to encourage this expression with full force and ensure that we can stand on our own feet and make it impossible for the systematic looting and plundering of our human and material resources that have characterized much of our modern history to continue. This is the significance of the concept of Ghana beyond aid, indeed, of Africa beyond aid. This year, we will be commemorating the 400th anniversary of the commencement of one of the most unfortunate and barbaric episodes of human history, the transatlantic slave trade, when the first 20 West African slaves were brought to the Commonwealth of Virginia, which subsequently became part of the United States of America. Dubbed the Year of Return, the commemoration is a statement of our determination that never again should the African peoples permit themselves to be subjected to such dehumanizing conditions, sold into slavery, and have their freedoms curtailed in order to build up forcibly countries other than their own. <laughs> and create wealth for the peoples of our unknown lands to which they were sent, wealth from whose enjoyment they were largely excluded. We also want to use the events of this year to solidify our relations with our kin and kith, descendants of Africa here in Amer the Americas and the Caribbean. <laughs> it should be obvious to all black people in the world by now that their dignity and standing are in, in, uh, intricately bound up with the dignity and standing of Africa. Thankfully, thankfully, most of Africa has decided to chart a fresh and new path. It is my hope that it will serve as the impetus for reshaping our countries and constructing a new road of growth and development and freedom, which will lift the long-suffering African masses out of poverty into the realms of prosperity and dignified existence. Joseph Bwachidankwa, the Ghanaian colossus who was the father of modern Ghanaian nationalism and founder of the political tradition 
that gave birth to my party, the New Patriotic Party. Said as far back as 1961, over 50 years ago, at the height of the 20th century Cold War, that the party's policy is, quote, is to liberate the energies of the people for the growth of a property-owning democracy in this land with a right to life and freedom and justice as the principles to which the government and laws of the land should be dedicated in order specifically to enrich the life, property, and liberty of each and every citizen, unquote. This is our vision of human empowerment for Africa's golden future. It has been a great pleasure for me to spend my 75th birthday amongst you. <laughs> It's an experience I'll not forget in a hurry. Once again, I thank you sincerely for making a part of this conversation and for your kind attention. May God bless the peoples of the United States of America and Ghana and Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. I cannot think of a better way to begin the Africa Development Conference than with a speech that is focused so much on the youth and the youth leadership for the rest of, of Africa's future. I think the, um, for those who are not aware, the Africa Development Conference is celebrating its 10th birthday. And it is a student-led, youth-driven event. And what I think is so powerful about that is it is an agenda set by youth who will be the leaders um, of the future and are today already practicing that. So um, we have mics on the floor. We have two in the wings, and then we also have two in the loge and the balcony. It is the, the strong tradition of the Kennedy School Forum that we have open and respectful, publicly-oriented um, dialogue. And so His Excellency has very generously agreed to um, respond to questions for about 20 minutes. I'll take them from all sides. Um, please introduce yourself. Please ask only one question, and please ensure that it is a short question-oriented question. Um, I think without further ado, we'll begin on the right-hand side. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, uh, His Excellency Nana, uh, for that wonderful Pan-African uh, speech. I'm very sure beyond doubt that our uh, great ancestors, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Nelson Mandela Madiba, uh, Milka Cabro are very, you know, uh, positive about what you've talked about. My name is Seguia Hillary Innocent Taylor. I am a Ugandan and I'm doing my master's in international relations here at Harvard. I wish uh, we could, you know, exchange you for our Ugandan president, oh, uh, oh, oh, oh. dictator General Yuri Kaguta Museveni, who has been in power for 33 years, because we are telling him enough is enough. He has to go. Do you But have again, a question? Uh, now to the question. Yes. To the question. I'm going to be precise. As an advocate of education, um, I believe in the right to education because it's a basic human right that each and every child deserves. Can I use that? Uh, His Excellency Please. Nana, uh, you have talked about uh, the cocoa production in Ghana, and you are saying that 100 billion US dollars is worth uh, of that sector in this country. But again, uh, Ghana has only 6% of that uh, value chain of cocoa bean production. And we are looking at you know, uh, challenges of children being put in uh, you know, these cocoa production uh, you know, uh, plantations, children as young as the age of seven, they are being denied the right to education. And for the consumers in countries like USA, Canada, uh, Switzerland, they are enjoying this uh, sweet dark chocolate, but they can't tell the story behind uh, this chocolate. So uh, what initiatives or policies do you have in your government and also perhaps uh, other African countries as an umbrella through uh, the African Union? Uh, to ensure that we have a fair, you know, uh, fair uh, policies uh, to the consumer and also to uh, the farmers and also to the companies that are engaged in the cocoa production. Thank you so much. Thank you. You may oh, uh, respond. Okay. Yeah. 
um, child labor in the cocoa industry. This is something that has been highlighted for some time. And a lot of measures have been taken in Ghana to reduce its incidence considerably. I think it is much less of an issue now than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Secondly, there's still elements of it there, largely because the culture of young people helping parents and families on the cocoa farm is something that is still very persistent. But it's important to remember that many, and there are some here who have gone through that experience, do it at the same time as go to school. They help out in the holidays and go to school in normal times. That's also a feature of this industry. But the focus on reducing its incidence is very strong, and it is working. I believe that any of the studies that are going around the world today, when they look at what is happening in the industry, both in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, will agree that its incidence has diminished considerably. Secondly, we can have taken the view that there's very little we can do about getting our policies right in trying to scale up the, the value chain and receiving more and more value from the product can't be done in isolation. So that the Cote d'Ivoire government and our government are today working very closely in determining policy, in determining the price at which our farmers go into the market, and also determining policies as to how much of the product will be processed locally as against being sold in the raw form. And already it is having an impact on the way that the market is evolving. I think it's very important. Um, somehow or other, um, the farming populations of our two countries have been have benefited from the fact that Alassane Ouattara and I are in office at the same time and have very much the same common understanding of what we need to do. So we signed what we call even a strategic partnership between Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, which revolves around coordinating a strategic attitude and policies towards the development of the industry. Uh, there are new markets, for instance, that have not been brought into play. We're talking about three or four billion people in Asia. Uh, 1.4 billion in China, 1.3 billion in India, and the rest of the, who have not been particularly exposed to the product. So there's an aggressive joint marketing drive that is taking place there. But the fundamental thing is that we develop our capacity to build the industry, the entire value chain at home. And that is what we're launched on and are doing now. Uh, the, the warehouses for storing the product instead of sending it abroad are now being created. The African Development Bank has lent its support to this activity on both, on, on both uh, countries. So there's a whole stream of things that are being done, the purpose of which is to scale up the, our, the, the, the value that we receive from the industry and thereby, of course, increase the earnings of our cocoa farmers. Ghana, for instance, for over 100 years, has depended almost exclusively on the toil of our cocoa farmers. But that at long last, that there will be policies in place that will enable them to get more and more value from their work. So these are some of the things that are being done. There are others, uh, skill, other technical decisions that have been taken about getting a cocoa yield, uh, a cocoa seed that produces a much quicker output than we've seen in the past. Uh, and increasing also the education of those who are going into the industry. So it isn't just with respect illiterate farmers who are doing it, but now increasingly more and more educated young people are also going to. It's a whole gamut of things that we have to look at to be able to make something of this industry for ourselves. But the present arrangement is clearly intolerable. It, 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 it's not fair, it's exploitative, and I think that we have to work 
to, to bring that to an end. Thank you. I think this notion of, of leveraging African cooperation instead of competition has historically been so important. So I'm, I'm glad we can hear it here first. Yes, up at the top, please introduce yourself and keep um, it short. Uh, Your Excellency, it's an honor to be able to speak to you. And thank you for spending your birthday with us. Uh, <laughs> My name is Radith Kaitana Talabu. I'm a sophomore at the college from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, I'm also the vice president of the African Student Association. Um, before I get to my question, just a quick thing. I wanted to say that I highly appreciate and like I'm very inspired by your and your government's strong stance b behind Ghana Beyond Aid and the need for African independence and unison. Uh, I wanted to ask about <coughs> Sorry, I wanted to ask about the free senior high school policy, which honestly sounds quite amazing. Um, from my knowledge of rural Ethiopia and other African countries as well, it's my understanding that for the communities that are most affected um, by poverty, uh, there lie several significant barriers that don't allow them to get to secondary school in the first place, regardless of there being a fee or not. Um, such as having to help out their families with work, early marriage, having to walk a long and dangerous distance to school, sexual harassment, and so on. Um, so I would like to know your initiatives in order to enable these communities to benefit from the free education that you've provided. Thank you. Obviously, we have some structural problems that we have to overcome. You, in Ghana, the policy in 2017 and 2018, the two academic years that have been since the policy came into being, nearly 300,000 more students have had access to senior high school education than they had in the past, than they had in, say, 2016. But they're doing so with the same infrastructure, the same stock of schools and the same infrastructure. That, of course, means that very major challenges are being faced by this enhanced population. So the first matter that we're trying to tackle is infrastructure, to expand the existing school network so that they can absorb this population better. And then, of course, to build more schools. Because ultimately, the issues you're talking about is to be able to have schools in virtually every part of the country so that people can access education, not just on paper, but in reality. They, um, that's, that's a key aspect of it. Another, of course, is the pool of teachers, because it is the quality of the instruction that you get that makes education, even more so than the bricks and mortars that you have to have to be able to go to school. So we are having to pay a great deal of attention to it. Unfortunately, uh, in recent years, those who made education their focus of study, so many of them were unemployed and sitting at home. So we've started bringing them back into the, into the educational, into the teaching um, stream. And that, of course, is providing us yet with another tool for dealing with this. But fundamentally, we need to put more, even more resources into the educational structure than we have been able to do up to now in order to have this even spread of education across the country. In the meantime, one thing that we have, we have been able to do, which is also having some impact, is that there's a, a deliberate effort to put people from, if you like, badly situated or underprivileged schools, a certain proportion of, the, of the, their population into the better endowed and the well-known and stronger schools in Ghana. Um, you had phenomena last year where people in villages who had never dreamed that their children would go to the high-sounding schools in Ghana like Achimota or Wesley Girls or the Fancy Pim or Holy Child, uh, villages going on for days of jubilation because one of their children had found their way to Achimota because of the system that has been established. So that is uh, a corrective measure that is being used to make sure that we infuse some equity into the development of our secondary school system. But the problems that, are, that you have highlighted, ultimately we can only deal with it by having enough schools around the country. And that is something that 
is, is ongoing, but will not be solved overnight. Uh, it's, I, I can't give you a more uh, optimistic uh, response than that, but it's a realistic one. But I believe that the problem is being identified and efforts are being made to deal with it. Thank you. We'll go next to the upper balcony on the left. Uh, your Excellency, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to listen to your speech about the development in your country. I'm a freshman at Harvard College, and I'm interested um, in the issue with the foreign aid from China, because if there's one hand saying that they bring many positive impact, especially in things you mentioned about adding value to the raw value from the agricultural sector. They might also provide more employment opportunities for people in the local area. But on the other hand, they might also saying might add more loans to the country, debt crisis, and other stuff. So um, I'm very curious from your experience in your country and maybe also your insights about Africa in general, how, how do you see the current Chinese uh, investment and Chinese um, growing um, projects in Africa and what kind of attitude that you think the, that you should take f for the future? Yeah, thank you. I think we have to begin with the statistic that is the most relevant one. China today has the second greatest economy in the world. It means that everybody has to deal with China. Here, America is involved with China, Western Europe, everybody, because of the size of its economy and what it means. So yes, we in Ghana, we have a very, a very strong and constructive engagement with China. Today, China is the, uh, the single largest trading partner of Ghana. Um, Chinese investment in our, in our economy is quite significant. And it is in areas of, 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 of great importance to us, especially in our infrastructure. The relationship has been that it is, and it's been, it's, it's undergoing an evolution of its own, so that today we are not ex accepting what 10 years ago the arrangements for butter arrangements which hinged on the pledging of our natural resources for the Chinese assistance. That is gone. Uh, uh, we've entered into an agreement, for instance, um, with an important Chinese corporation that is advancing a lot of money to us for us to do our infrastructure and is going to take in payment refined bauxite uh, products, i.e. aluminum. This, that was not an arrangement that we had, we had before. It is the arrangement that we have insisted upon and the Chinese all, uh, on their side have accepted. So the relationship itself is in flux, but it's an important relationship for us. Um, in terms of loans, well, uh, we have to pay as much attention to um, our debt to GDP ratio as with any other country. So what is China giving to us? We have to make sure that it is within a sustainable basket for ourselves. Now that is our decision to make. And we, we are not making these decisions on the basis that somebody is prepared to give us money. Somebody is prepared to give us money which will allow us to create value and assets amongst us in, in, our, in our situation and therefore make it easier for us to service and pay back that loan. So yes, we have strong relations with China. I was there last September. I paid a state visit there, and on top of it also took part in the Fokak in Beijing. And I found it a very constructive experience, first of all, to see what was going on in China itself. I hadn't been there for over 10 years. And discovered that this single-minded determination to leave the old China behind and go towards a new future is one that I found very admirable. And it is one that I like to have replicated in my country and on our continent, a single-minded focus that we're leaving the old Africa behind for a new Africa of growth and prosperity. I saw that in China, and it inspired me a lot. So we have time for one more question. I'm going to come to this side. 
Thank Please you. introduce yourself and keep it brief. Hi, uh, birthday blessings to you, His Excellency. My Thank name you. is Shahara Jackson, and I am a first year doctoral student at the School of Education. Um, as a descendant of America's original sin, chattel slavery, uh, in recognition of the 400 year re return to the homeland, uh, what is the physical and or financial infrastructure that is in place to potentially welcome uh, descendants of slavery back to Ghana and the continent um, in light of what is going on in our world today? Where is about the infrastructure for receiving visitors, hotels, and the rest? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I think that's what we're looking at, that the numbers that will come will have places. And also, a lot of Ghanaians, I mean, a whole structure is being set up to deal with the year of return. One of the things that we're discovering is also that a lot of people are offering their homes and themselves as hosts and hostesses for those who are coming. So we're now having also to work out how that will work um, in, in, in reality, but there's a lot of enthusiasm for the project of the year of return. Uh, there's a lot of things for people to see. So organizing that, seeing all these slave castles, which unfortunately dot our coastline, but they are now sort of UNESCO historical monuments, um, and the numbers that are coming, all of that, we're working on it as we speak. But I'm very confident that by the time of June, July, August, when we're expecting the inflow of people to arrive, uh, we will be in a good position to, to give them a very good welcome. Uh, it's important for us. We've taken it on upon ourselves to do this. And at the end of the day, I think, I hope you're going to be one of those who will come back. Uh, uh, ah, already? Yeah, so it's not going to be new to you when you come back. I've been given the green light for one more question. Yeah. So we'll come to this side, which is otherwise neglected. Please, sir, welcome. It's the most important question of the night, actually. <laughs> what? Uh, one more question from the left here. Um, how you doing, Mr. Excellency? Um, I, so you say in Ghana, you say Aquaba, ah. and, you know, and also happy birthday. My name is Paul Bismarck. I'm a student here at Harvard. Um, I was once a refugee in Ghana when I was a kid. I grew up in Ghana. You probably know the Buduburan refugee camp in Ghana. I grew Liberian. Up, so, yeah, I'm a Liberian. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was very important that I be here today to you know, see you and, and, and because I know Ghana is an essential part of my life you know, growing up as a kid in Africa. I was able to be hosted there for many years of my childhood and today I'm a student here. It really means a lot to me. However, my question relates to, um, um, as you know that we as Africans, when it comes to our identity, our identity is very um, fluid and there's a lot of intersection, intersection of our identity. However, what solidifies our identity is the way we treat our communities and the way we interact with each other. So my question is, what kind of policies are you setting in place in order to work with other African countries that have other resources that Ghana might need and what some other resources that um, um, other countries might need. For example, Liberia have the largest rubber plantation in the world. So every, almost every single tire that you ride on your car that's a firestone or brickstone, it comes from Liberia, you know, raw, raw material. But everything is being shipped out of the country and there's no factories, there's not, nothing we can do with the rubber. So Ghana being like an example of economic prosperity and also um, freedom and all that. What are some of the policies that you have in place right now to work with these countries? Thank you, sir. I think one of the things that is now accepted, is, uh, it's, it's data, it's statistics, is that we in Africa trade less with each other than other parts of the world. I mean, for instance, intra-European trade, trade amongst the members of the European Union. I'm talking 2017 statistics. Figure of something like 70% of the collective GDP of the then 27 countries in Europe, of the European market, was, would trade with, them, with themselves. 
and only 30% of their collective GDP was trade with the world outside. The same kind of figures uh, in, exist for ASEAN in Asia, and for within the Americas. In our part, it's 15%, the continental wide, as the number of the, which reflects the trade amongst ourselves. So to create the conditions to heighten intra-African trade has to be the answer to your question. We need that. And fortunately, after a lot of talk for the last five years, last year in Kigali, we signed an agreement for the emergence of the continental free trade area. As we speak now, 52 out of the 55 uh, countries on the continent have signed up to the agreement. The one big missing link is the, the chairman of the board of trustees of the center, his country, <laughs> Nigeria, great Nigeria, is the missing link. But 52 countries have signed up and the agreement provided for 22 countries to ratify it for the uh, trade area to come into being. We now have 21 countries that have ratified the agreement and deposited their instruments. And there's a meeting scheduled in Niamey in July where hopefully we can launch the continental free trade area because our anticipation is by that time 22 countries would have signed up. We in Ghana and Kenya were the very first to deposit our instruments of ratification because we believe strongly that that has to be the way forward. If the continental free trade area comes into being, it will be the biggest trade area, free trade area since the formation of the World Trade Organization. We're talking about something like two and a half trillion dollars. <laughs> in this so what all of us need to do is to continue to push this idea, tackle whatever institutional obstacles there are to freeing up trade amongst ourselves and insisting that this has to be the way forward for the continent. Because then we have the, co the, the, the context, the framework to address the issues that you have just put before. That is the way forward for us. And hopefully in July, uh, the world will hear a positive statement from the African side and will then begin to put in the building blocks. Uh, is one of the most important decisions the African Union has made since it came into being uh, nearly 20 years ago. So we, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it will not just be people putting pen to paper, but putting pen to paper which will then spring into life and make a difference in the way we're doing business on the continent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Friends, distinguished guests, this is a very serious conversation, um, but today is a day of jubilation. And I will not forgive myself if we do not honor His Excellency with happy birthday. Ah. So if you will, um, please use Your Excellency when you reach the relevant line in the song. <laughs> this is our cultural tradition of, of uh, celebration for you. Thank you so much for well, spending it with much. us yeah. at the Kennedy School. I cannot vouch for the pitch um, with which we'll sing this song, but if you all join on the count of three. One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Ha ha ha.